were trying to set up a demo, but we failed, uh, um, given the time crunch. Um, we'll do that some other time. Um, so for some reason, it's not showing up while well there, but there's a question mark at the end of do not upload yourself. It's not meant to be me telling you not to upload yourself, not, not to upload yourself, but it's all about should we or shouldn't we be doing some of these things. And I think that's one of the big things that, uh, in terms of awareness and thinking about some of the things that you're doing in your everyday life, you might want to take some of these things into context and perhaps wonder whether or not, if you're using social media, whether or not you should upload this next picture or upload this or send this next text message that you've possibly sent. And that's, I think, the crux of the problem when it comes to computer security and cybersecurity, more, though, more than just the technical component. What we want to show you is a really cool technical thing where we wrote a program, or our, uh, our graduate student there, Roberto, wrote a program where it creates a wireless point. You connect your apps to it, so your phone, you just connect it. I was going to let the audience connect to our app and then monitor the traffic. And what you'll quickly see is that we can intercept your pictures, your messages. Most of the things are not secure because they're in HTTP rather than HTTPS. It, that would have been a lot of fun for me to see what you're doing in real time and for you to see what everyone else in the room is doing in real time. But um, given the time constraints and the technology constraints, we can't do that right now. So if you were interested in that, come to our lab in Buckman 101 and we can show you that thing in action, okay? So, a little bit about us. Um, we have a research group that's called the University of New Haven Cyber Forensics Research and Education Group. Yes, it's a mouthful, but it's interesting, I think, uh, since it's a mouthful. Uh, I would say uh, Dr. Frank Breitinga back there, um, he co-directs that group with me and that research lab with me. And we're really trying to do some cool stuff here. Um, I think we've gained some international recognition. Um, we discovered some apps or some security issues with apps uh, that went beyond being translated to over 20 languages all over the media, all over the world. So that was kind of fun. Uh, we have a, a number of research projects that are currently going, up, and we have some funded projects in place. Um, that I can sort of discuss uh, some of the things we might not be able to discuss in some ways. Uh, you can visit our website for more information, which is unhcfrag.com. Okay, so if you want to learn more about some of the things that we're doing, simply visit our website. All right, so do you want to upload yourself? Do you really want to upload yourself? And that's a question you should be asking yourself. So a lot of the devices that you're using every single day have some sort of component to them that uploads your data somewhere, all right? Such as health data, banking data, tax data, email data, um, uh, what else? Pictures, uh, pictures of newlyweds, pictures of babies, uh, sexting, a lot of people sex, not just text, sex, you gotta add the sex before the text, no sex. Play games, network with people, find a job, apply for a job. Um, Buy almost anything. When I say almost anything, I mean almost anything. All right, if you go into the dark web, you can buy almost anything. All right, buy anything, I mean drugs, illegal material, all of that stuff you can do online. So whenever you hear people talking about the internet, they're like, oh, this is the wild, wild west. Basically, all over again, it's a super highway, there's all these bad people, they're trying to catch you. All right, this is old news, okay, great. So what? What can we do as individuals to counter that problem? So, where does this data go? Where does this uploaded data go? Now, most of you, who's heard of the term cloud? Right, put your hand up really high if you've heard of the term cloud. Okay, now keep it up, keep your hand up. All right, if you've heard of the term cloud. Now, keep it up. Okay, keep your hand up if you don't really know what cloud is. Okay, keep your hand up if you really don't know what cloud is. Now keep your hands up, keep your hands up. All right, <coughs> all right. 
So Dan, you know what a cloud is? Yeah. Tell me what a cloud is. Uh, cloud is uh, servers and stuff that's not local. Dumb. What's a cloud? Well, I would agree with that. It's a bank of servers that's collecting data. Okay, I'm here. What's a cloud? Cloud uh, is uh, allocating services to people in a virtual environment. Okay, Frank, what's a cloud? Well, I would say kind of everything. Everything that we we do on the internet. Mark, what's a cloud? A group of servers that host a group of services online. How many how many people did I ask to give me an answer? And how many of them were different? How many of them were different? All of them were different. You probably didn't notice, but all of them were different. Okay? That's an issue. All right? All of you that said, oh, I know what a cloud is, and you upload your data to a cloud, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I know what a cloud is, so therefore I understand that my data is in the cloud. All right? I do this for a living, and I can tell you with certainty that no one knows what the cloud is. All right? In fact, I ran a survey, and I asked, experts around the world, and every expert had a different definition for what cloud is. Some people say it's virtualization of hardware and software. Some people say it's services that are online. Some people say it's elastic, so you can expand it just like the Amazon Web Services. Some people say it's like a utility service for the internet. Some people say, okay, so the point is, what is the cloud, right? And that's an important question that we as computer scientists and we as also social scientists need to understand and wrap our heads around. How can we convey to the, to the people what a cloud is? Because what's ultimately happening is that we are taking normal people and we're telling them, put your data in the cloud. Because now they think of one cloud. They think of it as a very nice, simple thing that I can use without knowing what it is. All right? You don't have to know how to use your phone. You don't have to know how to use the apps on your phone and where the data is stored because it's in the cloud. Right? Okay. So, part of this problem is the fact that whenever you're using these applications in order to communicate with people around the world, your data is being stored in the cloud. All right? So, do you use any chatting applications? What, what, give me an example of a chatting application. Skype. Skype. Where's your data stored? Yes, in the cloud. Okay. <laughs> in what country? Yeah. Oh. How many countries? Oh, wow. All right. Now let's think about this for a second. So we ran an experiment, and I'll talk about this, and Dan led that experiment. He's up here. He's an alumni of ours. And the point of that experiment was for us to test social networking messaging applications like WhatsApp and some of these other apps and see if we can intercept the data that's going back and forth and see if the data is encrypted or not encrypted so that we can get a better understanding of where this data is stored. And once we did that, okay, we found out links that are being transferred. So basically when, when you send something to a person, it's actually sent to the server and then the server when the person wants to receive that image, it's downloaded from the server. It's not sent directly to the person. There's an intermediary step. Okay, I send you something, Mark is the server, Mark receives it, and Mark says, hey, I'm gonna send it to you, and then he sends it to you. All right, that's exactly what happens. So while we were doing that, we found some links. Now, Dan, when did you run this? <clears throat> Six, seven months ago? Yeah. Maybe a little more. Actually, oh, it's more. It's more. Yeah. All right? And these are the links right here. All right? So Instagram has a function, and it's called Instagram Direct, where you can send a picture to a person, not post it on your Instagram profile. All right? So it's a, it's a private picture that you send to your friend. All right? And this private picture, was sent about seven or eight months ago to your friend. Now let's click on this. That picture is still on their servers. All right? Let's look at something else. This is 
<coughs> Uvu, which is another chatting application. And this image was sent over six months ago, and it's still there on their servers. So the only reason we know this is because we actually went and we intercepted the traffic, and then we understood how they're sending things back and forth, and we got to this point where we now know this stuff. And then you have Grindr, and this is actually a video, I believe, right? Or, or, or an image, I forget, that was sent, maybe it was a picture, I don't, I don't remember. But the point is, on Grindr, a lot of people actually use Grindr for hooking up with someone else. All right? And when you hook up with someone, typically there might be sexual exchanges of pictures and other things like that. Well, those are still on their servers. So think twice before you do that. All right, let's go back. So then the next question becomes, from a cyber forensics perspective, which is what we do, People like me, people like my students, people like me, <coughs> our whole goal in life is to try to find out ways in order to investigate computer crimes. That's what we do. Okay, when I say ways, I mean tools, methods, people, all of the above. Okay? But most of the time, we focus on tools. What are some of the tools that we can use, that we can build, so that the normal investigator sitting in a lab that's not you know, a scientist can just click a couple of buttons, that's called push button forensics, and get data out so that they can just get the evidence. Right? And that's typical in all forensic sciences. Okay, you have investigators who can do fingerprint or legal fingerprint scanning, or you have people that do DNA. So the people that really do DNA are the lab rats, and then they give the data to someone else, and then they have the evidence, and then it becomes part of the case, so on and so forth. So then the question becomes if you're doing DNA, right, you're going to a specific location, or if somebody killed someone and there's like blood on the floor, you're going to a specific place where there's a knife, that knife was used to kill someone, the blood is on the floor, and that's it, right? Most of the time. So that would be probably your primary, <laughs> so that would probably be your primary crime scene. You wanna go then maybe to a secondary crime scene. So maybe that person right now went in the backyard and there's a lake and then they threw their knife in the lake. So that would be your secondary crime scene, right? So on and so forth. Well. This whole thing with the cloud, which we don't know how to define, and I challenge someone to be able to see this is what the cloud is. That's beside the point. The, the, the problem here is, okay, if this happened in the USA, then we know what the laws are in the United States. We know the admissibility of evidence regulations. We know all these things. If it happened in the cyber world, where are the laws? If my data is stored in different locations at the same time, what laws govern that data? How many of you will use Dropbox? Put your hand up if you use Dropbox. Keep your hands up. How many of you know exactly where the Dropbox servers are? Okay, put your hand up. How many of you will use Google Drive? How many of you know exactly where the Google Drive servers are? Okay, you do? I guess it's in Oregon. Oh, really? Okay, so, so Google, let, let's, let's, are you sure? Do you guess or do you know? Uh, I have seen a documentary about the uh, servers. Is it only in Oregon? Not in only, but the largest one is in uh, Oh, so you said the largest one, one, right. Okay. Because Google has how many data centers? Not, I don't know. I don't know who knows how many data centers. Okay, something to think about. All right, so what do you share? If you just sit down, and you just jot down some of the data that you've shared with the cloud. Okay, just sit down one day and start jotting down some of the things you've done in your everyday life. Be like, what advice, what data have I shared? Okay? Imagine the data are your clothes, just for a second, all right? And you're in a public place, and now I'm telling you to, to take off, the, to take the data off of you, right? How naked are you going to be? Public, you be pretty naked, all right? Because you've shared so much stuff with that cloud that no one knows what it is. You've shared social technical behavior. What's that? That's the way you behave online. 
some of the things you do. Okay, like for example, um, has anyone watched Sherlock, the the new version of Sherlock that was released, I think, by the BBC originally? Put your hand up if you've seen that. Okay, do you remember the episode where um, John is is about to get married and and Sherlock interviews somebody and he's like, you better step off this woman that John is getting married to. And it's like, how do you know? He's like, I actually calculated the time you respond to every post she puts on Facebook. And I found that there's a strong correlation between the time when she posts something and how you respond to it on Facebook, indicating the fact that you actually like her. <laughs> You're laughing, but it's true. All right. If someone posts something on Facebook and you have this annoying person always doing it, oh my god, this is great, oh my god, I like this, oh my god. All right, what, what, why are you doing that? There's probably some reason behind it. So whenever you have social technical behaviors, those are interesting. You can figure out a lot of things from those, okay? Um, I have a friend, his name is Minton Agarwal, who's at the University of Arkansas Little Rock, and a major bulk of his project is to see, it is, was to see how the Saudi mo uh, women movement propagated through both Twitter and uh, and blogs, and they were able to map that out. Okay, interesting stuff. So, social security numbers, credit card numbers, names, IDs, banking info, addresses, <coughs> GPS locations, pictures, IP addresses, work history, purchase history, life event triggers, which companies love that. They love your life event triggers. Okay, if you just post it on Facebook, I just got married. All of a sudden you start getting these emails or these things, these ads that pop up that relate to newlyweds. Take a vacation and spend more money. Having a baby, okay, buying a home, even getting divorced, companies target that trigger, getting divorced. All right, you might, get a divorce and all of a sudden you might get a message saying, hey, uh, are you feeling lonely? <laughs> you know? Want to hang out with someone? Use Tinder. All right? The point is, all life trigger events, and if you notice, who's on Facebook here? Who's on Facebook? Have you ever used that video making thing that they do at the end of the year? Did you ever notice that it focuses on life triggers? Did you ever know, like, oh my God, how did they know that this was an important moment in my life? Well, you told them. You told them it's an important moment in your life. They didn't know that. They predicted it based on past history. They predicted it based on certain models using machine learning and other things, but that's how they know that it's an event trigger, okay? There was actually a story um, not too long ago. I forgot what company it was. What I, I, I believe it might have been Target, where a lady, received, um, I believe it was coupons, or I, I don't really remember what, what the story goes, or how the story goes, but I think they received a letter about like buying baby clothes and things like that by mail, and the girl's dad was like, why are we receiving this? I, you know, we should, I, we don't wanna have any kids. And he called the company up and he's like, you can't do this, don't send stuff like this, blah, blah, blah. A week later, the girl says that she's pregnant. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this, right? The girl says she's pregnant. Her dad finds out and he's like, oh, that's why we received it. Because they detected that trigger because she was trying to go online and find baby stuff. Okay? So then we get to the point where perhaps systems can predict us before we predict us to some extent or know us in real life. And that's a little scary for you to think about. Maybe it's scary, maybe it's not. Buying a home is another important one, right? I'm thinking about buying a home. Boom, you get slammed with mortgage stuff. That's happened to me. I started getting phone calls from about 10 people every day. I was like, I don't want a mortgage. Thank you very much. So do these things really happen? And in order to prove that they do, to some extent. I mean, I can give you stats all day, and that's boring. But I did something more interesting. I went on Twitter, and I typed, my computer got hacked. And I got this. Man, logic, my computer got hacked. My computer got hacked. First I got a ticket, then a flat tire, then they changed the wrong tire, now I'm blah, blah, blah. 
bad words there, doesn't matter. <laughs> Ever since my phone credit card ID got hacked, I think my credit card got hacked. This person, uh, I, there was another tweet which I found interesting that I kept out of there. And basically, apparently he was in school, using a computer, computer got hacked, and there was pictures of a celebrity's butt all over the screen. I thought you'd laugh, I thought it was funny. <laughs> okay? Um, more stuff. Phones broken, my Facebook email got hacked all in one weekend. Blessed? That makes no sense. Okay. So, this is the overview video created by Dan on the app stuff that we did, okay? It doesn't show you the experiment. If you want to see more, go to our YouTube channel, have a look at the video, see our experiment. But this is pretty much the overview video for you to quickly consider. Hi, I'm a member of the University of New Haven's Cyber Forensics Research and Education Group. And through our five videos, we'll be showcasing security issues and over a dozen anchor apps. The goal of this research is to inform both the user and the developer of these issues. This is day five of five. Today we'll be analyzing the application data storage for forensic artifacts on the Android and iOS device. For the data storage analysis, we created logical images using XRY. A similar process can be done using iTunes Backup or Android Backup Extractor. There's a link in the description for more details on Android Backup Extraction. We opened up the logical image of the iOS device in XRY, and we went to the database tab. We found a database file for Line, which stored all of the user's chat logs. Next, we found a database file for Vine, which also stored all So from a data storage perspective, on the devices themselves, we were able to find usernames and passwords, we were, because they were not encrypted. We were able to find the chat logs. Even one app, and then interestingly enough, took screenshots of your friends, phone. Which stored all of the users' chat Without logs you know. as well. Yeah? Does this program only really work if the phone is unlocked? It depends. We this process well, there's too many depends. It during our research. depends what version of it. Okay, like, that's what I'm thinking. Final listing of With the newest version of iOS, we're, we're having a little bit of problems. But we'll get we over want to sure. note that the apps store data differently depending on settings, OS version, and manufacturer. So findings may vary. All right. The point is, with that experiment, you can go through the, the other you know, the stuff on your own. But with that experiment, I think one of the things, there's a couple of things that came up and which we found interesting. The first thing is, when you take the amount of users combined with the applications that we tested, it's over one billion users. That's quite a large number, okay? The second thing is, we notified the companies ahead of time before releasing this, and companies didn't do anything about it, all right? When we released it, a lot of the good ones patched it within a week. Because they're like, man, this is gonna destroy our reputation. Another thing we learned is, there's no formal process of informing companies about these things. So basically, this whole idea, there's a, there's a big research gap area there where we need to let companies know about things and they need to proceed fixing them as quickly as possible. And that's still an ongoing problem in cybersecurity. The other thing that we learned is that programmers can be sloppy because they just want to get the thing to work. They don't really focus on making it as solid as possible. Okay, so there are a lot of things that we learned from this exercise. All right, so where do we go from that? So what I told you, really, what it boils down to is that you're sharing data with the cloud and you don't know what the cloud is, right? That's what I told you. Like the whole thing that you took away from everything I said is that <laughs> you're sharing data with the cloud and the cloud, and you don't know where the cloud is. So think about this for a second. Four years ago, I was starting a company and I was thinking of all these ideas that I wanted to start. And one of the ideas that I found fascinating, which is really weird, is can I develop an artificial intelligence algorithm that can take over your Facebook account once you die? I told you I'm weird. But then I started thinking, that's an interesting idea. Right, it's an interesting idea not because the, the, the problem to solve is interesting, that's a part of it. But then I started thinking, well, I'm a big guy. I'm probably going to die before my wife. And now my life takes over. I'm dead. 
right? And she sees my Facebook account. Mm -hmm. And then I get married to someone else on Facebook. Now think about that, just for a split second. Think about that. Like a dead person's artificial intelligence life gets married to another person who might be alive on Facebook, right? And your wife sees that happening, or vice versa. I mean, it doesn't matter. That's an interesting idea. What would happen? How can we differentiate emotionally between something virtual and something physical? Okay, although the physical has emotional connotations and both of them are attached to it. So then I started thinking, okay, the reason I titled this is don't upload yourself. It's not about your data. It's about the next step beyond that. The next step beyond that, what we see in sci-fi movies, right? We see you uploading your brain to the cloud, right? Think about that for a second. Now we know who you are. We know the things that you do. We know your social technical behavior. Can we recreate you as a digital entity? Absolutely. All right, it's an interesting concept. Now, let's move beyond that. Why would you want to do that? If I sat down here and I told you, by the way, you can upload yourself. Why would you want to do that? Well, there are several, several reasons why you want to do that. One is you don't need biological functions anymore. You are alive in this digital world. You don't need your heart to work. You don't need your liver to work. You're gonna live. You're gonna exist. This is digital. You can extend your life. Okay? With an in-app purchase, all of a sudden, I have a phone that's a digital phone in my digital life, and I want to extend my life for 10 years. Boom. I just paid to do that. Done. Okay? Back up yourself. I'm going to need a large server to back up myself. But let's say I can back up myself. But I can make infinite copies of myself. I don't need just one copy of myself. I want to be a virus. I want to copy myself. OK? Even if it's meant in the matrix. How about less threat to the environment? There's less methane gas going around. There's less things burning down. Is that the good thing? I don't know if you thought that for a second. Easier to improve yourself. I want to be skinny, therefore I'm going to render myself as a skinny person. Now I can run much faster. And on top of that, I can change the laws of physics. All right? I'm now a digital artificial intelligence entity was in the cloud, and now I can change the laws of gravity. I don't want to. I want to fly. I don't want to walk. I can do that. Why not? You can download yourself, if there's still a physical world, into another entity. Right? I want to be Pamela Anderson for one day. Maybe not, but if you want to be Pamela Anderson for one day, we can provide you a cloud service for that. Okay, see the eyes, see the world through Obama's eyes. See the world through Mark's eyes. Right now Mark's looking, he's like, I hate you, I hate you. So I don't want to see the world through his eyes. Send people to space, cheaply. What if I had someone in space already, and now you wanted to experience space, therefore I send over your digital life and download it to another entity that's in space? No longer will space voyages cost us as much as they do right now. Some things to think about. So, should you upload yourself or should you not upload yourself? That is the critical question. Thank you very much for coming.
okay? A cloud is a service provider. A cloud is a utility, like electricity. A cloud is a bunch of servers that offer services. It's not just one thing. A cloud could be a virtualized server. There are multiple different definitions. There's software as a service that could be regarded as a cloud. When you log on to Gmail and you have multiple different services laid out for you as an individual, that could be regarded as a cloud. Okay? When people say it's servers, that bothers me. Because servers are data centers, and data centers have existed for many years. That's not what the cloud is. It's part of what the definition of the cloud could be. Yes? Is there any possibility that in the future, these kind of virtual entities take action that have their outcome, you know, reflected in the real world? Yeah, why not? I think, in some ways, that's, that's happening now. Like, for example, with the Google flu. Okay, based on your search results, so a lot of people go on Google and they search for flu, the flu medicine or flu medication. Google mines that and then presents you with a pattern of how the flu exists within the United States and other parts of the world. Where is it located? Where are like, the where people doing it? So they can track who has the flu, basically. You can track who has the flu, basically. Without even knowing who they Without are. testing someone for the flu. So you think about this, this is digital, data, but it's representing things in the physical world. So I think what you said, it's already happening. It's not that it's not happening. In some ways, it's already being done. So if I back up using carbonite, and it's just daily backing up in the background, who has access to that data? Is that, do I own that, or can, it, can a search warrant go after it, or who? Oh, you mean as a cloud, like a storage service yeah. provider? That That's going to depend on the policies and the services of the company that you buy stuff from. It's ultimately up to the organization and the policies they define. And where it's located. So, and well, and what you're paying the company and you're contracting with the company directly. Some stipulations might come from certain government entities, but that's not the case all the time. I'm a business, my business does, that's what I do, et cetera, et cetera. How the companies respond to questions from investigations, government agencies, things like that. Again, there are, I mean, I wouldn't say there are very strong legal requirements at this point for that sort of thing. And thus, if you heard about Apple, Apple saying we're not gonna cooperate with law enforcement as, as much as we have done in the past, basically. So, your question leads to a whole lot of other questions. But I think the main crux of the issue is, whenever you're using a service, read the agreement as closely as possible if you really want to know the full spectrum of things. And in terms of who has access to them, it depends on the implementation of the technology. There could be someone sitting in the background looking at stuff. Like for example, I read an article about how Google mines your Gmail for child pornography now. In case they find it, then they'll report it immediately to law enforcement but they're just going through your email, is there a child born, is there a child born, yes, there's a child born, okay, we're gonna report this person. What about even just the process of it being uploaded, is it going through non-carbonized service, it's going, it goes to Comcast, I guess, that's the internet? Whoever your so, service provider is. So they, they can, they can, it's not encrypted, they can yeah. So, 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 so that's right? Yeah, so that's a good question. So when we did the research that we did, um, we showed that a man in the middle attack was possible because the data is not encrypted. So basically, what we did was we set up, to some extent, I mean, if you look at it, but we set up our own service provider using the wired internet that we have, and we connected the wireless access point, and we were sniffing data in transit, okay? In Comcast, they can do the same. But Comcast doesn't really do that much with that stuff, and the service providers really try to stay out of that as much as possible, yeah, because they, they don't want the burden of having to collect that data. They don't want the burden to be on them. They don't want that. Couldn't they sell a lot of that? Isn't there a real market for the, There's a bigger market for them taking your money every single month. <laughs> it's a much bigger market <laughs> to, for them to do that as a service. And what they're trying to do now is, that, so with net neutrality issues and all this jazz, what they're really trying to focus on is 
oh, if you want to use Netflix, Netflix uses more bandwidth, and therefore, you might want to pay more for service that supports Netflix. So now they're, tiering, you know, they're creating more tiers for people, and that's going to be the case as time progresses. Netflix is another one. Who has Netflix here? Put your hand up. How many of you are always weirded out by when you scroll down, you're like, hey, um, how do they know I like this movie, even though I never watched it? Because they have an algorithm that matches certain movies that you like with certain other movies. And that's AI, right there. That's artificial intelligence. Yeah? Um, what, I guess, what's the role of like, private browsing options on your, you know, like you talked about So private browsing online. option doesn't work that way, <laughs> okay? Um, from a normal computer person's perspective, it will work so that it won't save a lot of data on your computer, but even then there's some data that could possibly be saved because I did research on that. And not only that, I did portable web browsers to the point where I'm launching the web browser from a USB stick so that if I go to someone's house, I don't have to use their computer. But even them, they're not, they're not that good. The whole point of, of private web browsing is to attempt not to store data from the browser on the, on the hard drive. Right. That's it. But in terms of stuff going in and out of your network, it's still going in and out of your network. It does not change that. Yes? Do you think VPNs are uh, any, anything effective? So VPNs are good, but there's one problem with VPNs. Is that you can, so if you're trying to hide your traffic through a VPN and you're using a certain VPN server, then it's one server. It's one company you're dealing with. So the chances of me catching you are quite high. Because when you connect to that company, I'll pick up the phone, like something that might be illegal going over to the network that you're connecting to. Now, if you use something like a distributed peer-to-peer um, -peer type system like Tor, the chances of you being caught are lower. But then there are ways to counter that. So you can actually create a, a, a malicious exit node on a Tor network and try to sniff people's data and then send them back malicious things. So that is a possibility. But that's why Tor exists in the first place, is for anonymizing web traffic. But the idea is, if you don't know what Tor is, so imagine all of you are logged on to Tor right now. Okay, and we're all in different countries. And I start using my web browser. The traffic from my web browser will go through all of you. And then it'll exit in some random country. Okay, so that way it's very hard to trace. This is going through so many people at the same time that are all connected to the same network and randomly it goes throughout one exit. And that creates a problem for investigators, obviously. Okay, but if we get access to your hard drive and we find Tor on it and we see you've been using illegal things, then you're caught. Because we're like, oh, hey, you know, we, we found all the evidence we need. But we, we do need access to your hard drive for that. So you need a warrant. Hmm? You need a warrant for it. Oh, it, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> if you're within a company, you don't need a warrant. They just go up to you. Like, we don't fight you. You're fired. By the way, you're fired. Like, they're probably <laughs> So, yes. Are there any apps you trust and use or know to be aware of? So the rule of thumb, which I don't follow very well, is don't be stupid. <laughs> I, I don't follow that. I mean, my Twitter handle is Cyber Shawarma. <laughs> so I mean, I'm cyber and I'm Eric and I love Shawarma, so it's Cyber Shawarma. Um, but it depends. I mean, like, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I, I, I think we're so integrated into our mobile devices that even the tech people, like Frank right there is probably chatting with someone on his phone. <laughs> and he's a professor in cybersecurity. You know, like it's a sad world we live in, but it's also the world that we need to sort of accept. Um, yeah. When is the next RoboCop coming out? <laughs> a real RoboCop. So now imagine a RoboCop with all that information stored in his or her brain. Pretty crazy stuff. Right, Mark? So really yeah. Good. Yeah. Question. So any pictures, any information that we offer is not going to go away. It's going to stay forever. 
So, so I'm going to ask you that other question. Okay. When do you think Facebook will go out of business? You think they'll be around for another 10 years? And they'll be around for another 20 years? 10 years? 20 years? Yeah. So, I mean, how, how much longer are we all going to live in here? Well, it depends. Are we going to make copies of ourselves? Um, I am anyway. <laughs> you want to make? It, you want to upload yourself? Well, no, I just make copies at yeah. my own personal server. Yeah. If I was myself, that'd be cool. Does anyone here? Would anyone here mind uploading their stuff? Like, would anyone here would do it? They're like, I. That's a cool idea. I want to upload myself. So, like, remember, like, it would virtually know every single memory that you have. We don't know that. Your brain is electrical signals, theoretically. I mean. I, I don't know. I don't know the, the the biology and the physics behind it and all that jazz. I can see it from an artificial intelligence perspective because there are you, you have variables and you manipulate them. You know, everything that we do in our life, if you think about it logically, boils down to decision making, right? And decisions are made based on how we evaluate things. And there are various different ways to look at that, like rational choice theory, other criminological theories, if you're a criminal, and so on and so forth. But what it boils down to is, should I do this or not? You know? And the way you make decisions as a person is a specific algorithm, the way you grew up. So you could just copy that, and then that's your conscious being based on that decisions you made, and you just copy someone. Possibly. Yeah, right. I, I've never done that. I mean, yeah. It would be cool if I did How far away So that's reality? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it's already reality. Someone could have already like made it, yeah, the government could be doing it. Maybe on it. I mean, who knows? Maybe right? virtual soldiers. I mean, did you just see uh, this company, I don't know, I forgot what European country it is, but you can fly drones with your mind now. Like literally, you can stand in front of a screen all day or sit in front of the screen and you can fly the drone anywhere you want just like with your pet. You don't have to do anything. That would be great for Homer Simpson, right? Like sitting down there, and then, well, although he doesn't have many brain capacity. I don't think he could do it. So, yeah, I don't think he could. <laughs> but what if I could do that? What if I could sit in the classroom and pass on the information to you right now just by going? <laughs> well, I probably wouldn't be here anymore. I'd probably just do it at home. See, I'm already talking to you. You've got brain powers. Oh, yeah, even the mind part thing, I went to the CES and they like, I went to the IEEE booth and I uh, did the, I raced a car with my mom. It was pretty fun. Oh, you did? Yeah, I won. Did you? Yeah. It was really weird. They basically just kept, like, in the beginning, you think of a thought, like, a car moving, and they captured that, like, the electromagnetic signal from your brain that emits that thought, and then they're like, go, and then you think of the same thought, and it reads that. So depending on how strong that signal is, it powers the car to go forward. It was cool. I mean, that's super basic, but, you know, wow. it's probably like, way more basic than driving a car with your mind. But. but, I mean, they said that their technology is ready fly real planes. Yeah, that's way yeah, that's They said that's how good their technology is. So. Probably would never get one of those. Yeah, I don't know. Because if they stop thinking, then I'm going down. Yeah, I mean, then the question is, so they started talking about in the article that I just read, like, well, you know, now you can fly an airplane, like, basically, you don't need a captain. Someone will fly you with their brains while sitting in front of a desk. And it has advantages. You know, they can have shifts, they can go to sleep, like the pilots and all that stuff. I, I don't want that. I, you know, it's not cool. Wouldn't it be easier just to program an AI to fly the plane? I don't think so. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't think so. I don't think so, but I don't know. I mean, I think I don't know how hard it is to fly a plane. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't do that on a regular basis. <laughs> Roberto, do you want to try and see if you can fix that while you were talking? If you can. It would be really cool to show you this thing working. But so is there is there any advice you have of like the really stupid thing to avoid is yeah. don't do this? Um, so if you want to do things that are really personal, separate them as much as possible from your profession. Okay. 
So if you want, if you come to the university and you have a boyfriend, or you have a girlfriend, or you have a secret lover, or whatever it is that you have, like use your personal phone to do that on a network connection that's not connected to the university. That's your own life. You don't connect to the wireless network here and send things to me. I wouldn't do that. Okay? To me, that's one of the big things, is if you have something personal, keep it personal as much as possible. Okay? And if you want to still use technol technological capabilities to still communicate personally, like go directly through the service provider. Use the GPRS or not GPRS, the, the TLE network on your phone, LGE network on your phone. Okay, don't connect to a random Wi-Fi spot or don't connect to the Wi-Fi spot at the university to do these things. Okay, because we can monitor that stuff. Starbucks Wi-Fi? Yeah. 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 Someone's watching that. Huh? Even if you're connected to Wi-Fi, still it's trackable? Yeah, of course. I just, I wouldn't do it. I'm telling you, I wouldn't do it. Is so, your Verizon signal more, like let's say Verizon, or you know, more secure in some way than... I wouldn't Wi say it's more secure. Um, it's coming directly from your phone. It's going directly to the service room. There's no man in the middle there. This is your personal life. Okay. I mean, if you look at computer investigations, um, most of the time, people are caught... This is working now? Um, okay. Um, so you want to start it again so they can follow through it? I'm scared to have them all go on. Well, I know, but, but let's let's try it as, as a. I don't want to try. Okay. So this app is called that app. All right. If you have a phone, pull it up. Just pull it up. <laughs> don't don't worry. Um, we want to see how 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 much did it crash. When I stopped it. Oh, you stopped it? If it was working, just keep, keep it working. Okay, so what he's doing there is that that computer is creating a wireless network when you create, create on create network. And it's going to be called 2 nh CFRAG123. So once he clicks that, you should see a Wi Fi point on your phone called 2 nh CFRAG123. Did you do that already? Okay. So, do you see a wireless access phone called UNHC Frag One Two Three? Just your Wi-Fi. Like if you assume you're connecting to a normal Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay. Do you see it? Okay. Connect to it. <laughs> so this, I, we could have called it UNH Student. Yeah. If we wanted to, I mean, you can just go there and click it, and that will create it. All right. So connect to it, and the password is your name, C-F-R-E-G-1-2-3. All lowercase? Yep, all lowercase. It's on the screen. Now. So we designed this application so that a normal person can download this on their computer, click a button, and then test the apps that they have, with them, that, they have that they're using, okay? So what I want you to do next is open up some apps on your phone or open up the internet browser. Okay. Someone searches something from China. Yep, someone's doing China stuff. That's probably you guys, right? <laughs> um, okay, so these are a lot. This is all the stuff you guys are searching for right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, so we have two countries so far, the United States, China. You see that most of the traffic is HTTP. <laughs> Was there porn or something? Yeah. <laughs> okay, whoever is using their phone for porn, please stop using your phone for porn. That, that sounds like a company, a phone for porn. Um, so, uh, use, so I'm gonna connect and use like Realtor, for example. To, I'm, I'm looking for houses, I wanna buy a house, let's we'll see what will happen. <laughs> is it like always running in the background? Like it can always tell you or? Yeah. yeah. So as long as your apps are running in the background, it's still running. Yeah, it's just connect, like it's just taking your, your traffic and going through it. And 
There's so many people here. How many people are connected? Put your hand if you're connected. Okay. All right. But the quick thing that you notice is if you look at the top right there, that's how many HTTP connections there are. And on the right side is HTTPS connections. HTTPS is secure. HTTP is not secure. Okay. Are there still images popping up? Oh, China is going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we need other countries. Frank, come on, give us something from Germany. Oh, there's 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 there you go. That's you? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's what. That's the whole point we brought the computer here is to show you this. So now you can test your app. Be like, I don't want to use this because it's not secure. It only shows that it's HTTP. That's what it shows so far. We want to do other things with it, um, but it's it's a it's a headache to do that. Oh wow! But what does it so, mean oh, that it's secure? That it's like that's a connection. How many connections it's received? Okay. So how many connections are going through? Right so now? you're intercepting the open. We're intercepting everyone's traffic. Oh. Okay, but the point is now you can pull out any app and you can see if it detects stuff from that app. That app, there you go. The so university probably gets this. <laughs> UNA, probably, I would say. No, I, I think they're. they're but what does it mean that so much is related to China? Well, they're using a lot of apps from China. Um, <laughs> the servers are located in China. So. It's not popping up for some reason. It might be cast uh, or or maybe a bot or Okay. Anyways, you get the point, right? So we'll be releasing that within the next week, two weeks, once it's stable, and then we're gonna offer it to the media so people can test their own. Who likes that app? Does anyone like that app? That's yeah. right. Like, would you use it? Who would use it just to test their application? If I like understand, if I really knew, like.